remember the name that he gave to it, but um, Steve Wolfram had a, a version of the second uh, principle there and drew the opposite conclusion to you. Um, yeah. And his approach is interesting. I don't know whether it's right, but you remember what Wolfram did in his New Kind of Science book. He analyzed systematically uh, all the discrete mappings of various dimensionality and argued that you could sort of classify them fairly coarsely into just about three or four varieties. You know, ones that were static, ones that were periodic, and then, you know, ones that became chaotic. But, but there wasn't much beyond that. You know, there was surprisingly little structure. And then he proposed this complexity matching principle. You know, the reason that we understood so much of the universe and uh, we liked it and simple mathematics was so powerful was because we were about as complicated as everything around us because there was nowhere else to go. You know, so, so you know, things can't get much more complicated and we've got pretty much as complicated as can be, you know, and so is the universe. After all, what's between our ears is easily the most complicated thing that we've ever discovered in the universe. It's not quantum mechanics, it's not anything that goes on at CERN uh, or in the Planck satellite. So that's an, another interesting version. The yeah. first one actually is our Tipler and I's final anthropic principle actually is the first one. You know, so there must be no horizons and, right. and so on. But yeah, so I wondered if you'd thought about Wolfram's uh, approach. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I, I think when, uh, if it turns out that uh, a lot of theories we can write down that seem are mathematically consistent and so on, self-destruct in some way by not being able to support life, like in your book with, with Tipler also, I think that's generally wonderful because the fewer the theories work, the more predictable things get, right? So in the level four multiverse with all mathematical structures, for me, the happiest outcome would be if, if almost all of those are stone dead, because then you can make a lot of predictions for where we are. Similarly, when string theorists find that the most in, of the string theory landscape doesn't inflate and is uninhabitable, that's not bad news for, for string theory in my book. It's good news, because it's making it more predictable. Uh, that said, I don't think any of, I think that approach that you just study the math and see what the math tells you is perfectly adequate on its own. We don't need to paste onto it any of these dubious assumptions. Let, we let the math speak, speak for itself. I think our job as, this, as scientists is to look at nature and figure out how nature works, you know, not to tell nature how to behave. So you showed, and I think Simon also showed this picture of a, like a, mov a movie film splitting into two, which was your paradigm for the Everettian branching. You also evoked, uh, at one stage, nonlinear chaotic dynamics. And I just wanted to be clear that, in a, in a, in a, obviously in a nonlinear chaotic dynamic system, those uh, two initial states may be very close together, but they're certainly not identical to each other because the dynamics is deterministic. Exactly. Now, in your, in, in, so that's it, yeah. So in your picture, does this initial state have to be absolutely 100% identical, or could they just be two worlds incredibly close together that you can't distinguish them? Uh, the latter, because what we do when we do experiments, right, is we prepare the experiment and we say, okay, now I have in my mind this conscious perception that this is how I've prepared it, and then we measure and we perceive the outcome, right? So as long as... As long as two things are, as long as we can't perceive the differences between the initial states, that, that's all that matters. And even if the, our universe itself can store all these very fine details, you know, I can't store all that many petabytes in my brain, or even kilobytes, the rate of my memory is going down the drain. So that very much, course, our, our own brains coarse grain very much, the picture, and it becomes like in your second option there. So those two those two pieces of film, or whatever they are, are actually very close together, but they're not... They're well, just identical. to put it differently, I, the basic point I was making is that you can, you can take a totally deterministic theory where the wave function is just evolving deterministically in Hilbert space and understand from that why things nonetheless will feel subjectively random. Because I can start out in a state, which is the, some unique state, and evolve into a, 
superposition of two different states have effectively been cloned, right? And I'm going to feel this and that. And it doesn't actually matter, ultimately, whether if I could, the super fine details of the initial state that differed so little that I couldn't perceive the difference. Okay, well, this was a great talk, a very powerful thing. Um, I, I, I loved it. And you, you addressed a lot of the uh, sort of uh, uh, source of, of unease with this way of uh, looking at quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. There's one which you didn't address, maybe you will next lecture, or maybe you skim through the, you, you sort of flew through the, the, the what you call the, the basis, the preferred basis problem. I'm, I, I don't know if it is that. Um, let me tell you what, I, it's, it's, it's my principal uh, uh, source of unease, and uh, tell me if you're going to, uh, no, it's not this, it's not at all. Um, quantum mechanics is not a, a wave function evolving through a Schrodinger equation. Quantum mechanics is about uh, an, an electron which gets somewhere and is seen somewhere. So um, in, in my textbook of quantum mechanics, uh, there was a, a long story about uh, spectra observables uh, and uh, 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 value of spectra of self-adjoint operator related to what I see, the reality. So um, I, I like all what you say, but then somehow, I, maybe I don't understand it. Maybe I miss something. At the end of the day, I see a, an abstract vector in Hilbert space with moves, and uh, it's not sufficient. It, it moves. I don't see where the branching comes from. I don't see where the uh, where this comes from. And uh, in all the example that you talk about, uh, there is always a card, a card like this or like that. Mm -hmm. There is a galaxy, which is this, there is a man. So there is always some extra structure to just the uh, wave function of all the Schrodinger equation. And this extra structure, I don't see clearly the role that it plays to connect with what I see. Ah, that, you put your finger on a very, something very, very interesting there. So, uh, so for truth in advertising, it's good that we all declare exactly our view on this. So as I'll talk a bit more about after dinner tomorrow, I have this very radical view where I think the math is really all there is to it. And I think there is some mathematical structure. And if quantum mechanics turns out to be correct, then what I, what I think is that we have this Hilbert space where, with a, this wave function evolving under a Hamiltonian or whatever, and that's it. And that if we are t sufficiently intelligent as, as mathematicians and we just study this in, d in enough detail and you do all the decoherence calculations, we should be able to derive from that all of the structure. That's what I think. I agree with everything should be in the math. I don't want to, the question is which match? Because uh, how would you respond to the simple observation that all Hilbert spaces are exactly um, isomorphic, all infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces? So Hilbert uh, space by itself doesn't say anything. Yeah, it's but a the, specific all Hamiltonians are not isomorphic. I th it's and there's a lot of structure there. The way you learn quantum mechanics, there's an algebra of operators which yeah. is different from, uh, which is not just Hamiltonian, it's much more. Would you just consider this part of the system or not? Well, the, the most beautiful outcome, I think, would be if you can ultimately derive it all from just the Hamiltonian by studying it in detail. Because it's just, I mean, there was a paper on the archive, I forget who wrote it exactly, which just said that, oh, whatever, it doesn't work because all Hilbert spaces are the same. I thought that was a very lame argument because he neglected the fact that then there is a Hamiltonian. And... Uh, and they are not all the same, and they all have it. The spectrum of Hamiltonian contains a huge amount of information. You know, so, so um, if, if, if you know, maybe I think one should. Tr How what? In quantum gravity is zero. Hmm? In quantum gravity is zero. The Hamiltonian. We should talk more of a coffee about the Wheeler DeWitt <laughs> extensions to all all of this. But I think you'll agree in non-relativistic quantum mechanics already. Already, when you just look at the Hamiltonian. There's a lot of math there, and there's a lot of ca decoherence calculations and such one can make. And, it, and um, so this is my hope for how it's ultimately going to turn out, that, that we need to put in very little structure and everything else follows. Uh, any conceivable collection of events, facts, beliefs, anything you like could be turned into uh, a mathematical structure in your sense. So I think it's a worry that it will be vacuous, this idea that you know, the, the realities are all possible mathematical structures because there is no limit to what you might just define to be a mathematical structure. You've just got to read textbooks of sociologists who use mathematics. It's a bit like a paintbrush. 
<laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't get anything out of it. So you could always do that. You know, so well, anything you <coughs> want can be turned into a, a mathematical structure. But I, it doesn't I, I see your concern, you. but I don't share it, actually. I think soci sociologists are not the best source of, of really deep insights about <laughs> math, necessarily. I hope I'm not offending any sociologists here. But there, there, there is this sense I get from talking to some sociologists that, oh, mathematical structures are just, it's all a social construct, really, and it's true, it's, we can make up whatever math we want. I think that's really not fair to mathematicians. Mathematicians prove work. So Hilbert famously said that mathematical existence is freedom from contradiction. Right? And that's very non-trivial. Mathematicians write very long and technical papers sometimes just to prove that some particular mathematical structure actually exists, that it's actually self-consistent. It's a very restrictive... Uh, Requirement, and um, if you certainly if you if you there is if you want to nitpick at this, of course you you might face something again akin to the measure problem in cosmology. If you have many different mathematical structures, say why do we see, find ourselves in a world that so that seems relatively simple, not in some other world? And that sounds like a great thing we should talk about also over coffee. But there, I think. We should all be honest and say, hey, we haven't even solved the measure problem in standard cosmology anyway, either. So it's not something we should necessarily blame the mathematicians for. My, my guess is still that there is some particular mathematical structure, maybe a relatively simple one, like something involving some Hilbert space and some other additional structure, we'll see, which when you study enough, you realize, hey, that's us. Okay, one final question. Just a very brief comment. Um, given the, the nature of this conference, I, I do think you slightly misstated Occam's razor. I mean, it says nothing about such and such a theory being too wasteful or too complicated. It's about whether something is more, and it's usually extravagant is a better word, whether if you have two theories, both of which make very successful predictions, etc., etc., and you're trying to discriminate between the two, is one more extravagant than another? I'm just, you know, in, in terms of being clear about what we're arguing, I would say the sort of the usual... So we should, I think reservation is a better word. The usual mm -hmm. reservation coming from the Occam razor thing would be, okay, so it involves postulating. In order to explain one observable thing, it involves postulating quite a lot of other things. It's not a, it's not a killer by any manner of means, but that's the nature of the object. It's always relative. So here we can see we have direct proof that Occam said complicated. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, seriously, uh, I subscribe. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Occam's razor principle, but to me... Again, extravagant isn't the number of protons you have to postulate. You know, if Andre Linde and Alan Guth are right, we have an infinite number of them anyway, right? So what does it matter if there are a few more? To me, extravagance is in, in, by introducing a lot of additional mathematical baggage. And, and for example, we had a beautiful talk here by Anthony Valentini about the Bohm interpretation. Why do I personally not bet my money on the Bohm interpretation? Well, because there, I actually need to introduce an additional piece of mathematical extravagance. We have to say, yes, there are all these particles that actually exist. And then there's also this beast, this wave, which lives in this super high dimensional space. You know, I have 10 to the 28 particles, so it lives in 3 times 10 to the 28 dimensional space and evolves around. So now I have to have these two things. Whereas, according to Everett, I only have to have one thing, the wave function. So in my book, Bohm is more extravagant than Everett. And I'm not using this as a... I'm not, it was a very interesting talk by Anthony, but that's, that's why, to me, Everett is simpler than Bohm.